Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, Zeppelin postcards uh, manufactured by uh, several countries during World War I. Um, the, um, um, probably all of you are familiar with the Graf Zeppelin, um, the Hindenburg Zeppelin, um, and all of the stamps that were uh, produced as, as a result of, of those, uh, um, those airliners, essentially. Um, I'm going to talk about um, an entirely different uh, an entirely different aspect of the Zeppelin history. Um, I'm going to talk about Zeppelins during World War I. Um, and because uh, uh, that's that's my area of expertise. So we're going to start with first an, an introduction to Zeppelins, about half a dozen slides where I talk to you about the use of of Zeppelins during the First World War. Um, and, uh, and then we're gonna look at German postcards um, about the Zeppelins, um, how they promoted propaganda, national pride. Um, after that, I'll talk about the French and the British who were bombed by the Zeppelins. And so their perspective was very different. Um, so uh, the French, Postcards will show outrage at the uh, at the bombing attacks, um, a feeling of just desserts. They got what they deserved um, when they started to be shot down. And there's a few uh, French Zeppelin postcards that, that show humor. Um, the British postcards are somewhat similar. They have the same outrage. Um, there is some fascination with the technology of the Zeppelins and and with the mechanisms for shooting them down. Um, there's a lot of postcards of, of fiery revenge, um, what, what I called just desserts earlier. And, uh, and then there's a lot of, of humorous, um, uh, humorous postcards, especially where they're, they're mocking the, uh, the evil Hun. So this first part on Zeppelins, I'm calling it Zeppelin 101. Um, the Zeppelin airships were created by the Graf Zeppelin, by um, uh, Graf is the German word for count. So um, uh, Graf Ferdinand von Zeppelin was a member of the, uh, uh, of the aristocracy. Um, and, uh, and he was kind of um, a, a low level member of the aristocracy. A count is not very high say, as opposed to a duke or a grand duke. Um, he was born in 1838, and he took his first trip in an airship when he was in the United States as a military observer for the, um, for the German kingdom of Württemberg. Um, and he was a military observer um, seeing what the, uh, what the Union Army was doing during the Civil War. And so at least once in Minnesota, he got a ride in a, um, in a Union balloon. Um, and that was kind of the start of his, his uh, experiences with, uh, with lighter than air travel. Um, the very first uh, Zeppelin airship that he produced, uh, I've got a picture of it here. It, uh, it first flew from uh, Lake Constance um, in the year 1900. Uh, lake Constance is the uh, lake that, that forms the border between Germany and, and Switzerland. The Zeppelin Company, which still exists, still has um, offices and a Zeppelin museum right there in Friedrichshafen on, on the shores of Lake Constance. Uh, his very first Zeppelin had two engines of 15 horsepower each, um, and it won't take much imagination to figure out that it didn't work very well. Uh, if there was any wind whatsoever, it went where the wind wanted it to go rather than where the people wanted it to go. But that was the start of, of his production of Zeppelin airships. Um, I should also mention that, that when I refer to a Zeppelin, I'm referring to actually an airship that was made by the Zeppelin company. Got it? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so there were lots of airships made by lots of countries uh, during World War I and even before World War I 
um, but the Zeppelins were the ones that were made by the Zeppelin company. And they were the most practical, the most useful of all the airships produced by any country in the world. Um, the, uh, the Germans actually started up a commercial airline service in 1910, and it lasted traveling between different, different cities in Germany. Uh, and it lasted uh, almost five years until 1914. And that meant that the German airships, because of this development, were, um, uh, were the best in the world. And the German airship crews were the best in the world by the time World War I started in 1914. Um, one of the differences, but the, the main difference between a Zeppelin and a blimp, let, let's say like the Goodyear blimp, um, is that the Zeppelins had an aluminum superstructure. Um, something like the Goodyear blimp is essentially a large bag full of helium, um, and it's got a gondola under it with engines and, and, and so on that, that, that move it around where they want to go. Um, the Zeppelin actually had a, an aluminum alloy superstructure. And you can see that here in this stereoptagon photo um, in which a Zeppelin was shot down and burned over England. And, uh, and you can see, even though the thing has crashed, you can still see the structure of it. That's all an aluminum, that's all aluminum, an aluminum alloy. Um, you can see the structure of it pretty well. And so that differentiated the Zeppelin from practically every other, every other airship essentially during World War I. So this is an example of, I don't know, this is probably like the third generation of airships used during World War I. These, this particular one, the naval airship L-35 was used by the German, German Navy in late 1916. Um, as I mentioned, it's got this aluminum alloy superstructure. And, and actually in this photograph, you can really see the structure underneath the fabric quite easily. Um, the inside of this is just absolutely crammed with individual cells, large bags that were filled with hydrogen. Um, the, uh, and so it was not empty on the inside. It, it had all of these, these very large bags of hydrogen. They were used for reconnaissance, uh, especially over the North Sea um, by the German Navy, and they were used as strategic bombers. Uh, a Zeppelin could carry two to four tons of bombs, which by World War I standards compared to any airplane that was built during the war, this is an incredible amount of bombs that it could carry. It also had gondolas. Um, at the very front, you've got here the command gondola, and in the front half of that is where the airship commander and, and uh, a number of other personnel work um, in steering the airship and, and making it run. Um, the latter half of the same gondola uh, contains an, an engine and a, and a propeller um, to help move it in the direction that they want to move it in. Amidships, there's two other uh, gondolas with engines and propellers. And then in the back, you've got another one that has, um, it's, that has a crew compartment and, uh, and an engine and, and propellers to, to move it where they want to move it. <coughs> the other thing I want you to get from this, from this picture is if you look at the bottom in the red, you can see the ground crew. And that gives you an idea not only of how many people it took to help it land, because landing and taking off were very dangerous because it could be hit by the wind and move sideways and, and crash very easily. Um, but so it not only gives you an impression of the number of people, it, it tells you the size of, this, of, of these airships. If you were standing on the ground and a Zeppelin went overhead, it's like you're looking at a cruise ship in the air above you. I mean, it was, it was literally of that size. Um, <clears throat> so the Zeppelins were used widely as strategic night bombers. Um, they were actually faster than naval vessels, but they were much slower than airplanes. 
and so um, and so they had to be used at night to avoid being shot down either by anti-aircraft guns or by uh, fighter planes. Um, the Zeppelins were easily thwarted by low technology uh, defenses like blackouts um, and also by the weather. Um, and, and so they had hoped to use them as bombers attacking things like um, ships in ports or um, munitions factories, armament factories, uh, rail stations, things like that. Um, and, and it turned out that because they had to, they had to fly very high up and at night to keep from being shot down, uh, especially by anti-aircraft guns. So what happened was when, when there was a Zeppelin raid coming, the Eastern half of England would be all blacked out. Um, and so they couldn't, they couldn't see anything. Um, they were often as much as 70 miles away from where they thought they were um, based on post-war assessments of, of where they thought they were and, and, and where ground observers saw them. Um, so the only thing they could hit with bombs were, were cities. Um, any other target was, was too small and too hard to see. And so they, they were just dropping bombs willy-nilly in, in cities, that's that. That was that was a good night for them, um, and uh, um, because of that, they were widely hated among the Allied powers that that attacked them. Um, the British labeled them baby killers um, because they were they were killing civilians, and you can get an idea from the um, from the yellow and red triangles on this on this map of all the places that got bombed by Zeppelins. This wasn't something that happened, you know, once every six months or something. It was, um, it was rather intense for a number of periods where they would be attacked by, where England would be attacked by, you know, a half a dozen or a dozen Zeppelins in, in one night. Um, so they actually had a wide range all the way up to Edinburgh, Scotland, I've actually been up there and, and, and seen, seen an area that had been hit by a Zeppelin bomb, um, but all the way through England. But they didn't just attack England and Scotland. Um, they had a tremendous range and they were used a lot on the Eastern Front. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, Zeppelin raids in the city of Hull, which is a port city on the northeast coast of England, which is where, where my ancestors are from. Um, and so I've done research there, including interviewing people who were children or teenagers during the Zeppelin raids in World War I. Um, they bombed Paris. We'll see some postcards from that. They bombed uh, Antwerp. Um, that was a very famous raid, and I'll show you some postcards from that and explain it in more detail. Um, they hit a number of other places on the Eastern Front, um, and, and mainly I've marked places uh, that, that later became capital cities after the Russian Empire fell apart, like um, Riga, Latvia, uh, Vilnius, Lithuania, Minsk, Belarus, Warsaw, Poland. Um, they also bombed in Bucharest, Romania. In fact, the Romanians declared war on, um, in 1916 on Germany's ally, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the very next night, they sent a Zeppelin over to drop bombs on Bucharest um, to uh, convince them that they were, they were making a mistake. You may recognize the name of the Palesti oil fields. Um, and probably most people think that they were that they were bombed first by the U.S. in World War II. They were not. They were actually bombed in World War I by German Zeppelins. Um, we'll see a number of postcards from uh, Salonika, which is in what is now Macedonia. Um, and I don't have any postcards that illustrate it, but um, but the city of Cairo was actually bombed once by a Zeppelin. So there was a wide range of places. Um, that were attacked. And this is, the, this is the end of my discussion 
generally on um, uh, on Zeppelin on, on Zeppelins before I start showing you some postcards. So I'll ask if there are any questions at this point. Questions, folks? Yeah, uh, where did they carry the bombs? The, the bombs were carried inside the uh, superstructure. Um, they were near the bottom of it and they were carried in bomb racks. Uh, and they would be released electrically by the people who were in the front gondola. So they could drop one at a time or they could drop a whole bunch all at once. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Steve, you had some um, blue dot-like items on your map of Britain. Um, what what were they for? Ah, the, um, the blue dots. The blue dots are places that were bombed by airplanes, uh, wow. almost all of which were either flying from were flying from occupied Belgium. Um, they had uh, go to airplanes uh, primarily that were flying from occupied Belgium and hitting the southeast coast. That was about as far as they could reach. Uh, and there were also some German float planes that were on the North Sea coast that were based on the North Sea coast. And they could also hit parts of England during, during the war. So this, this really shows just all of the, all of the uh, different kinds of air raids. And I was focusing on, on the ones by Zeppelins. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, about how many, how large was the fleet at any one time of Zeppelins? Um, let's see. They, there were times when they lost them rather quickly. Um, and so they might have, uh, at any one time from a dozen to two dozen Zeppelins, um, that were, that were available, uh, for bombing in England and on the Eastern front. They built something like Oh, um, 80 or 90 over the course of the war. But what was the range of a Zeppelin and how long was a, uh, what was their maximum flying time? Um, they could stay up for uh, over 24 hours. Um, and, um, and as far as the range, one time there was, there was a, uh, a Zeppelin that was supposed to provide relief to uh, an army that was in German East Africa. And this, this Zeppelin flew from a base in Bulgaria. Bulgaria was allied with Germany in World War I. And it flew down to East Africa and couldn't find the people that they were supposed to find and, and also got warned off um, by, by radio and I, I've seen I've seen different I've seen different stories that say you know either either the um, either the German forces in East Africa told them to to um, to give up and 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 not try and land there or that perhaps it was Allied disinformation and and I don't know which it was so it it flew from Bulgaria down into East Africa and back and that was essentially the distance from. Um, Frankfurt to um, to Chicago, hmm. um, and so they had they really had an incredible range um, if they were just you know going to one place. And of course, in the '30s, they were making round the world flights, um, yeah. not, not without stopping, but but um, they were do, they were routinely doing round the world and and and, cro and crossing the Atlantic uh, in their flights. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Steve, could, yes. uh, like in later airships, could they get into the superstructure? You know, catwalks inside it? Yes, actually, they, they could get in, During in flight? all of them. Yeah, they, they could get into, in, in all of them, they could get up into the superstructure okay. um, during, the, uh, during the flights. In fact, there were, um, I, I forgot to mention, there were ladders essentially from the gondolas that would allow them to climb up into the um, uh, into the superstructure, and then there was a walkway that went the entire length of it. Um, they could also take ladders up to the top, uh, where there were one or two machine gun stations to help protect the zeppelin from fighter planes. The ladders were inside the superstructure. 
Yes, yes. And then they'd come out the top. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, the, you, there was a ladder from the gondolas to the superstructure. And then there were additional ladders that went, went all the way up to the top. But the hydrogen is highly flammable. Uh, yes, yes. Um, the problem, well, <clears throat> it was highly flammable. But the, the problem, which took, which took the Allies over a year to figure out, was that you needed to make enough, you needed to make the, the gas bags leak enough so that the hydrogen mixed with the oxygen outside. Um, and once you had that happen and it was set on fire, then, um, uh, then it would explode. But if you were to just fire even tracer bullets, through one of these gas bags or several of them, it would go through quickly, it would make tiny holes and, and it would be gone long before there was enough leakage of hydrogen to mix with the oxygen and actually set it off in, in, into an explosion. Hmm. So, so the Zeppelins went for, were bombing England from January 1915 until September 1916 before the British finally figured out how to shoot them down with machine gun bullets. Mm -hmm. All right. And you'll see postcards of that. Yeah, yeah. We're looking right. forward to it. Other okay. questions, folks, before we get into the postcards? Okay, I guess we're ready, Steve. And then you said you'll take questions as they come up. Um, yeah, actually, I was thinking I would stop at the end of each of the three countries. Okay. And 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 ask if there's any any questions before I move on out of, okay. out of the topic. And my cuckoo clock is going. Um, can you? We're good. Yep. Okay. All right. So this postcard um, I, I bought in Maryland. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's an early World War I postcard. Uh, and it has a quote from Kaiser Wilhelm uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, and in, in English, it says, I hope that with God's help, we will wield the sword in such a way that we can return it to the sheath with honor. Um, Wilhelm II. Uh, and there's a little stamp on the bottom, a um, little hand stamp in red. And all that says is the war collection of Peter Muller, whoever he was. Um, one thing that's interesting about this postcard, there's nothing written on the back of this. It was not, it was not used postally. One thing that's interesting is that is that it was um, uh, stamped uh, stamped out on the back. Like for example, the the Zeppelin picture is actually raised a little bit, um, as are is as is this picture of the Rhineland and and this German German seal. It's actually not a flat card. It's it's uh, it's it the the uh, uh, the pictures themselves are raised. And I've never seen that in any other World War I postcard. I'll bet it made it harder to write on it, but. Okay, um, I have two postcards here of, um, of the Zeppelin attack attacks on Antwerp, Belgium. Um, World War I started at the beginning of August, 1914. Um, and by the 24th, of that month, the Germans uh, were raiding the city of Belgium with Zeppelins and dropping bombs on the city. Um, the Belgian army had, had retreated to several cities and they were sort of protecting those cities. Um, and, uh, and the Germans were trying to, to uh, uh, overrun them. And so in addition to attacking the, uh, the, the troops with artillery, they also started dropping bombs on, on the cities themselves. Um, this absolutely horrified the world um, that, that they would be dropping bombs on civilians. Um, it was very famous throughout the world. Um, there, were, there were a lot of accounts that were published in the United States about this you know, horrific outrage against civilians. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't hurt at all that there were American journalists who were in Antwerp at the exact time that the Zeppelins were dropping bombs. Um, so the, uh, uh, the card on the right is a really nice, you know, it, it's, it's sort of portraying something horrific, 
um, but it's uh, um, it's <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a beautiful card the way it's the way it's painted. Uh, the one on the left, I think, also was in color, but that that is one that I've, I've is a copy um, of one that I don't own. And again, there's nothing written on the back. Um, at the end of this section, I'm going to come back to the issue of the Germans bombing Antwerp and, and horrifying the entire world uh, with another postcard, the only American postcard I have. And so, uh, so keep Antwerp in the back of your mind. Um, and in about half a dozen slides, then I'm going to show you one uh, with a different viewpoint, uh, which is an American postcard. <clears throat> this is uh, the same idea. Um, this is a, uh, an airship attack on uh, the city of Warsaw, which was part of the Russian Empire. Um, and this actually happened. Warsaw was bombed. Um, and this actually was not a Zeppelin airship. This was a Schutelanz airship. Schutelanz was another company in Germany. Um, and their their airships were different in that they had um, they had a wooden superstructure instead of a um, uh, instead of an aluminum one. Um, but they were also you know reasonably capable airships um, as uh, well as, as as capable as they were as bombers. I I I think I left out the phrase that I meant to put in early about the zeppelins were not if very effective bombers. Um, they uh, um, because they couldn't see very much. Uh, and so they were just dropping bombs pretty much blind. And they were vulnerable to anti-aircraft. That, that was the point of that, was that they were not very effective bombers. Um, this is one where I, I do own this, and I have, uh, and I'm going to show you the back of it. Uh, I should mention that about half the cards I'm going to show you uh, are ones that I own. Um, and the other half are primarily from books or eBay images, things like that. Um, and I don't have the backs of any of those that I don't own. Um, and of the ones that I do own, really only a handful have anything written on them. So I'm going to show you the, uh, um, the back of this, this postcard. <clears throat> you can see the, uh, the stamp. It's a, a Deutsches Reich, German Empire stamp, um, five Finnig, uh, Finnig being one one hundredth of a, of a, of a mark. Um, the, uh, the postmark um, is, uh, uh, it's, it, it has the abbreviation for Saxon. Saxon is uh, what we know as Saxony in English. And it was, um, it was a kingdom within the German empire. Um, Germany was not technically one country at the time of uh, the First World War. It was really um, an empire of several kingdoms. Uh, the dominant kingdom was, the, uh, uh, was uh, Prussia, and the Prussian king was also the Kaiser, the German emperor. The, um, and there were other uh, countries, uh, there were other uh, kingdoms like Saxony, Württemberg, Bavaria, um, and so on. So this is referring to, to Saxony. Um, and this was postmarked on the uh, 6th of April, 1915. Uh, it was sent to some girl named Elizabeth something or other in the city of Trier. Trier is in, um, uh, is in Lorraine, France. Uh, when the, um, in the Franco-Prussian War, when the Prussians won in 1871, they, they annexed the French, um, French provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. And Trier is a city in Lorraine. The French have it back. And so the city now has its French name of Treves. Um, let's see. The handwriting, um, I, I, I really can't read this. Um, some of this is, is, the, is the Sutherland script. Which which looks like um, looks like the edge of a of a of a of a saw basically it's uh, and it's pretty much unreadable even even among modern Germans 
There's very few people in Germany who are old enough who can actually read this stuff. Um, and this seems to be a different script and it looks really unreadable to me also. So continuing the theme of national pride, um, the, uh, oops, um, this shows uh, a, a Zeppelin or some kind of airship dropping bombs on Venice, Italy. And at the same time, you've got an Austro-Hungarian Navy um, that's bombarding the city of, of Venice. Um, <clears throat> I don't think this is true. Um, I don't know of any time when the Austro-Hungarian Navy got close enough to Venice to bombard it from ships. Um, and I don't know any time in which uh, German Zeppelins supposedly dropped bombs on it. Um, Venice actually was attacked many times during World War I from the air. Um, the Austro-Hungarian Navy had flying boats um, in the Adriatic Sea, and they bombed Venice 42 times over the course of the war. There were also a number of other times, and I don't know the numbers, when, when the um, Austro-Hungarian army sent their airplanes over to bomb Venice. Um, but as far as I know, this is, uh, this is kind of a fantasy, um, this particular postcard. Um, here's one that is, uh, which I, I assume is a reprint. Um, I just from, from looking at the back of it, which has nothing written on it, it, sh it sure looks too modern to be, um, you know, early World War I or pre-war. This shows the very first German naval Zeppelin, the L1. And actually you can see on this, um, you can see kind of this structure, which is really like a keel. Um, and this is not visible on later models of the, of the Zeppelin. They, they put the keel kind of on the inside, um, but this sort of holds everything in place and the catwalk would be on top of it. Um, part of the national pride is, is is also their their pride in um, uh, in the people who uh, uh, who were the Zeppelin commanders. Um, this uh, this individual is a na naval officer, uh, Captain Lieutenant Franz Stabert, who was um, the commander of two different Zeppelins, one after the other. As they as they got newer models, they they retired the other ones, um, and so this is part of the um, of this of the Sankey card series. The Sankey cards uh, were hundreds of cards um, that portrayed people in, uh, who were uh, German aviators, um, frequently aces and uh, things like that. You know, the Red Baron certainly had, had his own Sankey card and, and uh, so did Ernst Udet and, and a lot of others. Um, this one shows, uh, um, Count Zeppelin, um, in, in essentially in memory of his death, um, it has his, his death uh, shown there in the upper right with a cross. Um, he died on the, on the um, I wrote down the 3rd of March, but that's clearly an eight, the 8th of March, 1917. Um, and uh, this is in tribute to him. There's nothing on the back. Um, except in the upper right-hand corner, and, and I really included it because it's so funny and odd. Um, this has, um, on the back of this postcard, it has 16 different terms in different languages um, to tell you that this is a postcard. Um, so it's everything from, you know, English to Spanish to French to German, <clears throat> probably Czech and, and Russian, Greek. Um, this one uh, is about our fallen Zeppel Zeppelin heroes, um, and these uh, and this shows the uh, uh, the picture the portraits of of three of the Zeppelin commanders who died over England. Um, the uh, the one in the in the middle, Hauptmann Schramm, and uh, um, Heinrich Matty on the right. Um, I've been to the sites in England where their Zeppelins crashed.
Okay, I'm going to back up and ask, uh, are there any questions regarding German Zeppelin postcards in World War I? Steve, do we happen to know how many Zeppelins were shot down? Um, yes, there were, uh, oh dear. Um, the, the easy answer is that there were um, uh, four that were shot down over England. Um, there were a couple more that were shot down just off of the coast. Um, but there were actually a lot of, a lot of Zeppelins that were shot down from the air, um, in, in other parts of Europe, um, and shot down from the air, shot down by airplanes, uh, were destroyed over enemy territory due to weather, uh, things like that. And I, I couldn't tell you, I couldn't tell you the number, but it was actually a lot. I mean, the Zeppelin losses, the, the losses of Zeppelin crews were horrific uh, because generally speaking, if something bad happened, um, it caught fire, you know, like the Hindenburg. Um, and, uh, and so you'd often lose the entire crew or, or the Zeppelin would come down, it would be disabled um, none of its engines would work and it would come down in the middle of the North Sea and never be seen again. Um, but, I, you know, I would say, I would say at least a third of them were lost due to enemy action. It was, it was really, really just horrific losses um, because they're flying these, these slow, uh, very flammable uh, airships. Makes you wonder how fast they can build them. Other questions? <laughs> they could. They could actually okay, build. I think I, we're good to move on now. I I think they built. Um, oh dear! At times they were building like two or three a month when they were really ramped up and uh, and providing them. So they 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 were able to to um, uh, replace their losses um, for a while. Um, and then when it started becoming clear to both the German army and the German Navy that they didn't do very well, they weren't effective bombers, they had trouble surviving, um, then, then they, they kind of uh, put their resources into other, other areas. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to the only American postcard that I that I have ever seen, um, and uh, I, I own this one. Um, it it shows uh, it's a colorized photograph of um, of what it looked like on the ground in Antwerp from uh, those those Zeppelin raids against the city, um, and you can just see um, you know what one explosion could do to uh, to a building, uh, and uh, and, and this is part of why it was viewed with such horror by everybody else in the world, and, and especially in, in the United States, which was neutral uh, at the time. Uh, it was just, uh, uh, it, you know, people were just, just absolutely taken aback by it. Uh, and it did not help Germany's reputation uh, among, among the, uh, the neutral powers. Okay, so we're gonna move on to, to uh, French postcards. And whenever somebody says French postcards, everybody knows what that means. Um, this actually is a period postcard. Um, I bought the book of these at the National World War I Museum. And so this is roughly dated to the First World War or maybe before. Um, the French postcards uh, exhibited outrage. Um, in this particular postcard, you can see uh, a two-story, two-story uh, apartment building, or, or well, two-story house, I guess, and and it's just it's like it's been cut with a knife. Um, it's just horrible, um, you know, horrible destruction on this on this place where people live in Paris. Um, <clears throat> it says the uh, uh, the Zeppelins over Paris, um, the odious crimes of the Bosch pirates. Bosch is a French slang term for Germans derogatory slang term for Germans. I think it means something like cabbage. Um, and then the, uh, the, the subheading says the, um, the house of uh, Corporal Bideau. 
And um, on the night of, there were only two Zeppelin raids on Paris. Um, there were a number of airplane raids, especially in 1918, but, uh, but in terms of, of Zeppelins, there were only two raids on Paris during the war. Um, the second one was on the night of the 29th of January, 1916. And Corporal Bideau uh, was killed, as was his mother-in-law, and his wife was wounded. Um, in the entire raid, 23 people were, were killed, and I think something like twice that many were, were wounded in, uh, in Paris that night. Um, now, this is part of a, um, a, of a series of postcards. Uh, I'm going to show you another one in that series. Um, and the way you can tell it's a series is you get the same, you get, it's the same company and you get the exact same caption. Um, the Zeppelins over Paris, odious crimes of the Bosch pirates. Um, and, uh, and here is a, uh, uh, one Zeppelin bomb that's hit and just showing the amount of devastation that's, that's, um, uh, that it's created. Here's another one, same theme again, the same, the same caption. Um, and, uh, and this one says in the, uh, in the subheading, uh, seven people were killed in this house. Um, this one is a, is a reprint. Um, you can see the stamp is the same color or lack of color as everything else. Um, and, uh, uh, in, in the, the French would put their, um, would put their stamps on the front of the envelope. Maybe they still do. I, I don't know. Um, but again, you've got this out, you've got this, uh, uh, you've got this photograph that just shows the horrible destruction. And all three of these pictures were, of course, from, from the, the second raid on the, on the night of the 29th of January. Um, there, are, there were other ones that were uh, similar. This one says uh, La Grande Guerre, um, meaning the World War or the Great War, uh, 1914 to 1916. It's at the town of Rivigny, and it says a house bombarded by a Zeppelin on the 6th of March, 1916. Um, and, and again, it's just showing this destruction um, from a single bomb against some place that somebody lives. This one, uh, we're, we're now reaching um, just desserts. Um, the, uh, can I, okay. It's, uh, this is essentially, they deserve to have, they deserve this. Uh, this is at uh, Brebant Le Roy. Uh, and this, this says the remains of the Zeppelin LZ-77 um, shot down by, it says auto cannons. That's like a truck mounted anti-aircraft gun um, at Rivigny on the 21st of February, 1916. Um, the LZ-77, which is here in pieces, actually three weeks earlier was one of the two Zeppelins that bombed Paris um, that, that was in the, last, in the last series of postcards that we saw. By the way, you can get a good idea of, of what the superstructure looked like in its details. Like you've got essentially a girder made up of little tiny pieces. And, and in some ways it's, it's too bad that we're not meeting face to face because normally what I do is I pass out, pass around um, a piece of, of, a, uh, uh, of a Zeppelin girder. Um, but you see the same thing here. And from those, they would construct that superstructure. Um, this is the back of that postcard. And I, I don't see any evidence whatsoever um, that this was sent through the mail. Um, I, this was, it is dated um, the 27th of February, 1917. Um, but there's nothing on here that indicates, you know, the use of postage or, or anything like that. <clears throat> Here's another one that's in the same, um, it's in the same series as the previous one. That's one view, um, the, the uh, um, what's left of Zeppelin LZ-77. And there's another one that shows that, except this one has this very gruesome 
picture of, of a member of the Zeppelin crew who had been, who had jumped or been, been uh, ejected from the Zeppelin and uh, is lying there dead. Okay. <clears throat> this postcard um, also shows wrecked Zeppelin pieces. This is um, from, uh, as it says on the bottom, this is from the Museum of the Army. Um, and, it's, and it's about the campaign from 1914 to 1916. Um, they didn't know they had still two more years of war to go. This is the debris from Zeppelin number eight, shot down at uh, Baronville by hour 75. What that means is um, the, the French, the French, the main French field gun was a 75 millimeter cannon. Um, and so that's what they're referring to, called the French 75, it's, which also has, has given its name to, to a cocktail. Um, you can see the, the stamp here. This is an original one, so the stamp is in color. Uh, and this was mailed from Ypernay. Um, which is uh, a little bit east of, uh, of Paris. Um, so this Zeppelin was shot down on either the 21st or the 23rd of August, 1914, um, about the same time that the Zeppelins were bombing, um, that other Zeppelins were bombing uh, Antwerp. And this is one that I own, so I can show you the back of it. Um, <clears throat> This has, remember this is, this showed a scene from the Museum of the Army. And so there's this red um, stamp here that, that talks, that says it's with the Museum of the Army. And I, I can't tell from looking at that if it was stamped on by a hand stamp or if it was overprinted in red. Um, on the other side, there's, um, there's one that, that is from the Committee of Aid for uh, Wounded Soldiers. Um, and it's got a red cross in the middle, though I, I don't really know if it refers to, you know, the Red Cross organization. Um, so, uh, so these are, these are, are with this. Um, this was sent from Ypernay, as I, as I said before, uh, based on the stamp on the other side on the 19th of May, 1917. It was sent by Grandmother Eugenie, to uh, to uh, Monsieur Henri, and I, I can't read that. I can't tell what the letters are. Who's in the family at Belfort. Belfort is a small French city, which is um, just on the edge of the Swiss border. Um, and actually there were a number of bombing raids against German territory that, from the city of Belfort. Um, so it's, you know, a grandmother, sending a postcard to, to her, uh, her grandson. Okay, um, this is another series of, um, of shots on the same topic. Um, this one is, um, uh, I, I think it's a beautiful debacle of Zeppelins. I couldn't find any word that, that, uh, that was closer. Um, a beautiful debacle of, of Zeppelins. Uh, from the 19th to the 21st of October, 1917, about 11 <coughs> machines left to bombard England. Uh, seven uh, landed, um, shot down or disabled. Um, one remains in, intact in our possession and the others have disappeared. Um, one of those others that it had disappeared um, they were they were fleeing back uh, towards Germany. Uh, they had run into a gale at high altitude over over England that was not apparent at all to anybody on the ground. Um, and so it was just it was it was a debacle for the Zeppelin raid um, in in October 1917. And one of them ended up, um, you know, all of its engines stopped functioning and uh, and it was finally swept out over the Mediterranean Sea. Um, trying to get back from uh, from England and was never seen again. So this is one of the Zeppelins, the uh, Naval Zeppelin L-49. Um, and it says here uh, that this is a souvenir of Zeppelin L-49, um, descended at bourbon les bains uh, in the Haute-Marne, that's a province, uh, on the 20th of October, 1917. This 
um, David Farnsworth tells me is a um, uh, says indicates that it was passed by a censor. Um, and I can't really make sense of the word, but it certainly makes sense given all the places you're going to see them in the next three slides. Um, this here is um, it uh, is a stamp from the Fifth Regiment of um, Engineers, and in the middle, um, if you squint at it long enough, you can see that it says uh, "Le Capitan Commandant," um, the captain, military rank, who's the commandant, the uh, the head of the Fifth Regiment of Engineers. Uh, it's it's his stamp on there. So um, I'm interpreting that as meaning that. A soldier could send this um, through the mail without having to buy a stamp. And we'll see some more examples of that. Um, and as I said, this is the first of uh, this is the first of, of a series. So on the next page, on, I'm sorry, on the back of it, um, again, there's no sign of a stamp. Um, and I'm a little perplexed because there doesn't seem to be a um, uh, an address. Um, but again, you've got the indication that it was, uh, um, that it was censored and passed the censorship. And then here's another one in the same series. It's showing essentially the other side of the L49 Zeppelin. And this is one of those uh, gondolas that has in it an engine, there's a propeller, and there's room for the crew. Uh, you can actually see a man standing on the on the ladder uh, that leads up into the superstructure. They can actually go down and perform maintenance and repairs on these engines in flight. <coughs> um, the very bottom it says the same same thing as the other one in the same series. And again, you've got some sort of stamp here, um, which has been dated. And then it has that same uh, that same little signature that indicates that it passed the sensor. This one has an address um, for uh, someone in Paris, and um, and again, it's it, this side also, since it has writing on it, has been passed by the sensor. I did try and find out what exactly what this said. Um, I've got I've got some friends that that uh, speak French, but one's a native speaker. But I I didn't hear back from them, so I I, I can't tell you exactly what it says. Um, um, <clears throat> there is uh, there is some humor occasionally in uh, in the French Zeppelin postcards. It's not all outrage and just desserts and stuff like that. Um, this is this is one that I own, uh, and it has uh, and it shows a, a zeppelin uh, trying to steal the Arc de Triomphe. This here means that this postcard cost me twelve euros. It's got nothing to do with postage. <clears throat> Here's another one. You've got a uh, you've got a couple looking to spend some alone time uh, and, and they want peace and quiet. And instead they've got, you know, this Zeppelin overhead and their searchlights and, and anti-aircraft anti -aircraft explosions and all sorts of noise and attention. And, and so they're saying, damn those Zeppelins. Okay, um, we're now at the end of the French postcards. Uh, and so if there's any questions about the French postcards or anything else up to this point, this is, this is a good place to stop and, and address those. Steve? Yes. Um, uh, the bombing of Venice. Was yes. there any strategic purpose in that or is it more just morale? Oh, there was definitely a strategic purpose in that. Um, the uh, Venice is, is the most is the most important and best equipped port on the Adriatic Sea. Oh. Um, and it was also very close to where the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, also went down to the Adriatic Sea. And so it was, it was an incredibly important port. They had an arsenal there. Um, 
In fact, they, I think they still call the Eye Island, but it's on the arsenal. Um, and, and, and so, and so it, was, it was a, a real a important, real. It, it was a legitimate target. It All right. wasn't, All just, right. uh, wasn't just bomb civilians and churches and things like that. Um, although having been there, I, I, at one point I saw a, um, an exhibit in a museum that showed pieces of a church that had been hit by an Austrian bomb. So, so there was some of that too, but, but, um, but there was a, a real purpose of them trying to hit uh, legitimate military targets. Other questions, folks? Okay, I guess we're ready for Britain. All right. Okay, now from this, um, you've seen what the French view as being risque, um, and this is what the British view as being risque. French nudity versus British nudity. Um, this postcard is, uh, is, a, is a replica a reprint. It's one that I own, but it's a reprint. Uh, and it shows the uh, bomb damage in the city of Hull, um, the city, the port city on the northeast coast of England, where my ancestors are from. Um, <clears throat> and it shows the devastation caused by, by a Zeppelin raid on, on the 6th of June, 1915. So the photograph came from a, came from a real original postcard. And the information on the bottom um, about, you know, the local history archives unit and, and stuff like that is, is, uh, uh, is, is modern. Um, <clears throat> the, the German Zeppelins were able to bomb England um, without really any repercussions from January 1915 all the way through August 1916. Um, and, uh, and then when September began, they started having trouble. Um, the, uh, they, the, uh, British started shooting them down because they developed, uh, explosive and incendiary machine gun bullets to, uh, to bring them down. Um, and, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that you've got to make a big enough hole in the gas bag to have enough hydrogen to leak out to mix with the oxygen, and that is flammable. Just hydrogen by itself is not flammable. And so by putting in a sequence of bullets, you know, like two explosive followed by two incendiary, by two explosive, by putting that into their machine guns, they finally, after, um, after 20 months of being bombed, um, figured out how to bring these down. And so the very first time one of these was one of these airships was brought down in flames at night, um, there were literally thousands of people watching. Um, and the next morning, there were thousands of people flocking to the town where where this uh, where this airship had been brought down. This is, um, and I'm I'm talking about this one on the right in particular. Um, this refers to Zeppelin brought down in flames at Cuffley near Enfield at 2.30 a.m. Sunday, September 3rd, 1916. Um, it's, uh, Cuffley is a little bit north of, Eng of, uh, a little bit north of London. And, uh, and the place was just mobbed. I mean, they had, they had troops there to try to clean up the mess, to try and recover whatever pieces they could that might give them intelligence value. Um, and they, and they just had, and they had to have a cordon of soldiers to mob them, uh, to uh, hold off the mob who was very interested in collecting souvenirs. And you can, you can still go to Cuffley to this day and you can see the monument to the, uh, the airship that came down. So there's this whole uh, bunch of, uh, of British postcards that, um, are, uh, um, that are, are touting the fact that these things fall in flames. Um, here's just another one. Um, the L-21, it turned out that the, this, the airship that came down at Cuffley was actually a chute lance airship, SL-21, um, but the British government didn't want to admit that it was maybe an inferior airship that had been shot down, and so they called it a Zeppelin, and they called it the L-21 um, for a while. <clears throat> um, 
this is is clearly a um, uh, um, a a, a, pic, a picture, not a photograph, um, and it's kind of done as as a memorial card, you know, with the, with a black edging, and you know, in never loving memory of L twenty one, you know, as if they were mourning the death of this. Um, this one looks like a photograph, and and it doesn't look right to me. I I think it's not. I think it's actually a painting uh, made to look like a photograph because the I, just the way the fuselage looks, it doesn't quite look right to me. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So there were lots of lots of different postcards. Um, there some have have rather um, gaudy uh, artwork. Um, this one shows the hero worship of uh, of Lieutenant Leif Robinson, who was the one who shot the Royal Flying Corps, who shot down the uh, who shot down the SL twenty one. Um, and this shows a uh, a British plane. It's actually the wrong British plane, but you know how would they know? Um, there was nothing written on the back, but still I thought it was interesting um, in that this, this fine print on the back um, shows that all of this was susceptible to, um, uh, to government censorship during the war. Uh, and this says it's passed for publication by the Press Bureau on the 10th of February, 1917. <clears throat> um, I, I think there's also just some fascination um, with, uh, with, with the Zeppelins themselves and with the efforts to, um, to protect the cities. Um, and, and I just get this when I, I just get this feeling when I look at these two postcards, <clears throat> I'm not seeing anything coming down in flames. It, it just seems like they're absolutely enthralled with, uh, like on the left, just, just the photograph of all of these searchlights, um, over London, um, searching for airships, uh, and and the same thing with the uh, with the one on the right. I, I think it's just a, a fascination with the whole phenomenon. Um, this one is is kind of interesting because it's um, if you, if you look at it carefully, like say you look at the at the uh, the two chimneys and the church and the church tower church spire, and you look at them again. You see the same thing from a different angle, and and in fact, you can see the same um, you can see the same explosions of anti aircraft um, on both of them. And I think these I think these are real photographs, and I think this is probably a stereoptagon um, set that they would that they uh, that they may have turned into or intended to turn into. Um, a stereoptagon image, so people could see it in 3D, um, because it's it's exactly the same picture, just two slightly different angles. We I mean, taken at this at the same instant, um, so it's kind of kind of funny. This one also, you know, is um, it's uh, publication sanctioned by official press bureau. Um, so the, the images themselves could be censored. Um, you also get hero worship. Um, the, uh, um, again, this is Leif Robinson, who, was, who instantly became a rock star when he shot down, uh, when he shot down the airship within view of, of most of London. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, people sent him uh, people sent him, uh, things to autograph. In fact, I have one of his autographs that, that somebody sent to him. It was a picture of him in the newspaper and he signed it and sent it back. And I have, I have one of those. Um, and, uh, and, and he was given a very expensive car. Um, you know, this is somebody who's, who's in the, uh, in the army in the Royal Flying Corps, you know, doing his, doing his duty and, and, and you know, all of a sudden, he's got corporations sending him cars um, because of this. So it was, you know, it's 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 almost hard to overestimate the effect this had on the populace of Britain after being bombed from the air by for twenty months, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, these things are exploding in flames and and falling where everybody can see them. Um, <clears throat> 
This is on, on the left, you've got another postcard of, of Leif Robinson. Um, that one cost me 20 pounds. It's rather unremarkable, but still, I thought it would be cool to own it. Um, the, uh, you've got another one here of this lady walking with this, uh, walking with this pilot. And on the left, you've got a, uh, um, you've got a uh, British soldier known uh, affectionately as Tommy Atkins. And you've got a British sailor on the right known uh, affectionately as Jack Tarr. And so the lady is saying, neither Jack nor Tommy can my whole affections win because I love the flying man who bombs the Zeppelin. Um, and actually he didn't bomb it. He shot it with a machine gun, but the, the British government didn't want the Germans to know that they could bring down Zeppelins with machine gun fire. And so they spread the story that um, he, he had been above it in his airplane and it dropped a bomb on it. <clears throat> and there are a lot of, um, of British humor um, uh, postcards regarding, regarding Zeppelins. Um, the one on the left, you've got the, the lady of the house in red talking to one of the maids. And, and she says, who broke that plate, Mary? And uh, Mary says, I don't know, mom. It must have been one of these Zeppelins. Uh, and you've got this guy on the right. I don't, I don't know if you can read it. Um, so forgive me if you can read it because I'll read it to you. Um, he's kind of a sad sack. It says, let not invasion scares or bombs from Zeppelins drive you balmy, for there's naught can harm old Britain now, for I have joined the army. Um, some of the humor took the, took the form of, of just mocking the Germans. Um, the one on the right called the gas bag shows, um, shows the, the German Kaiser looking like an airship um, and, uh, and looking rather ridiculous. Um, the one on the left, it, it's probably a little hard to see it, but, it, but, but what you're seeing is, is you're seeing an airship overhead <coughs> and it's dropping, um, it's dropping uh, bombs on and hitting a, um, a chicken coop. And so they, and so the caption is that they're they're quoting an official German report that says our gallant airmen successfully bombed a huge shell factory. And just like with the French, you've got people playing off on the on the idea of young people trying to uh, pair up and be alone and and left alone, and. Uh, um, and just how the, the Zeppelin raids make it harder, or you've got in the, on the right, you've got dad saying, coming by and, and saying, I say you two come out of that cellar. The airship's been gone ever so long. Obviously that wasn't what was important to them. Um, these two, I thought the one on the left was kind of funny um, with, with the guy's nose, um, but I don't even know what the lady is, is is saying exactly when she's when she's talking about what would happen if a zeppelin came down. Some expression that that I've never heard. Um, and then there's there's some they keep using the same jokes over and over of the of the little dog um, uh, getting protected by being under the lady's voluminous skirts. And this last one, you've got this man sitting in, chair, in a chair and there's a cat purring above his head. And he says, hark, I hear a Zeppelin. So um, that's it. And I'll take some more questions if you'd like. Hey folks, questions? One I have, Steve, was what is the Zeppelin company doing now? They, they have a museum. Is, it, is there anything else, anything productive? Actually, okay. yes, the Zeppelin company is is building blimps. Um, okay. They have um, they have uh, airships, um, and and the modern ones are uh, uh, use um, helium as the lift lifting gas instead of hydrogen, and they have um, they're they're called uh, the new Zeppelins. The you know the Zeppelin NZ uh, is what they call them, and um, and they have. Um, engines with propellers that swivel. And so they're actually very maneuverable. Um, so they're nowhere near the size of the old, 
zeppelins. They're more like the size of you know, the Good, Goodyear blimp. Um, but uh, but they're actually building building zeppelins. I think after after the Hindenburg went down, um, I they did other stuff for a long time, and I'm not sure what they were doing. It was metalworking of some sort. Um, but the company, the same company, still exists. <laughs> their um, their museum says almost nothing about World War One zeppelins. Um, uh, believe me, I, I looked very hard. Um, it's all about the uh, the airships that circumnavigated the globe and and flew across the Atlantic and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's it's a wonderful museum, but it was it wasn't full of the stuff that I that I wanted. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, I did buy a Zeppelin watch and a Zeppelin um, uh, beer mug and and a Zeppelin factory T-shirt. <laughs> so so mm-hmm. I enjoyed going there. Do you, in all your reading, did you ever come across the Count? Because I think you said he died in 1917. So yes. he was into the war at the end of his life in his, I guess, around 80. Uh, his response or reaction to the war, to his airships? Um, oh, I'm trying to remember. Um, I, I, I can tell you he was very happy to get the government contracts by the, by the German army and the German Navy to be able to sell his airships. Okay. okay. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he was horrified by what they put his, his, um, uh, his invention toward. Um, I, I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of, of propaganda and, and, um, and kind of turning a blind eye towards towards what the bombing was doing. Um, I mean, if if you read the accounts of of Zeppelin commanders, what they really wanted to be doing was they wanted to be doing stuff that was militarily effective, hitting you know armaments factories and things like that. And and the reality just made it impossible. Um, and so they were, and you know, I I think like. Like aviators throughout history, uh, and this started in World War One, and it, and it went forward. Is there's kind of this um, uh, mixed feelings about um, bombing civilians, um, you know that that sort of thing. That that supposedly you're doing something for your war effort, and yet it seems criminal at the same time. Um, so I I I don't ever rem- remember reading anything about how he felt about um, what, the, what the Zeppelins had become. And I'm not even sure he had a great idea of how ineffective a weapon it was and therefore that it was only, only usable for, for dropping bombs on cities. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Steve? Yes. I've, I've been to the museum in Friedrichshafen and uh, I was quite impressed with the size of the passenger area that obviously was a later model uh, Zeppelin, but was that up in the, in the structure? I mean, it was too, too big to be in a gondola. Um, oh dear. It was, let's see. I, I, it, it, it's pretty astounding because it was absolutely huge. I think it was, I think it was in, um, I think it was in the gondola because the gondolas for um, the uh, uh, the Graf Zeppelin and the Hindenburg were much larger than than they were during World War One, where they were only really used for for crew functions. Okay, um, they, they were they were quite it was quite grand. <laughs> oh yeah, it was gorgeous. Um, you know, it was just it was just phenomenal, uh, and and clearly something for only the very rich. Right. Um, but. Uh, um, I, I think if, if you've got a Zeppelin postcard handy and you look at it carefully, you can see how large the gondolas are underneath the airship and, and they're attached to it. They're not hanging um, compared to the World War I gondolas that I've been showing you. And they're much larger. Yeah, well, I, I actually did send my husband a, a postcard from Friedrichshaven uh-huh. uh, because I was on a bicycle trip. So uh, we'll have to pull out the postcard and take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful museum. It really is. Other questions, folks? Just a comment. I've spent the last 30 minutes looking for the postcard, but haven't been able to find it. Well, we thank you, Bob. When you do, send it to me and uh, we'll, we'll put it in the newsletter. Will do, but as Mike Bach knows with something I was looking for him, it may take me a year and a half. Hey, I, it took me a year for some find something for Mike too. So, all right, other questions? Okay, any uh, closing comments, Steve? And we yeah, this is Jim here from Southwick. I grabbed five of the uh, Zeppelin postcards I I had, and uh, one of them listed the the largest hangar in, in Germany there in Frankfurt, being uh, 280 meters long. 58 meters uh, high and 55 meters wide for working on it uh, on the zeppelins and there's uh, and uh, Hungary came out with a set of three on the 200 let's see uh, 150th anniversary of uh, uh, von Zeppelin uh, a phyletic set that I can show him after his uh, presentation is done if somebody wants to look at him. I would. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. We appreciate it. We, we give you our silence here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, very interesting. Yes, and what we're going to do, we're going to have a few show and tells now from our members. And uh, you're free to uh, stay and, and watch with us and join in, if you can. I don't know if anybody can see that. Okay, let's see. What there, that's a humorous one from the re German reserves during World War One. Ah. Okay, and uh, I had a, a came came across a set a few years ago of them making fun of duty, and this is their example of flying in a zeppelin. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's not the, the best right. postcard in the world, but it, the set originated in World War One. Here's the Hungarian ones. I don't know if I can do it. The honor, honoring von Zeppelin. Oh. There was a set of, if I can unstick them. <clears throat> They were in sleeves, but I did, figured the sleeves wouldn't show up at all. I can later scan these and send them to Paul. Yeah, that would be very good. And I'll, I'll pass them on to people. There's another one, and uh, it was actually done by the Hungarians rather well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this one here was the... Uh, that's the hangar mm -hmm. where it would work on and build them in. That's a rather large hangar. 